Every time. He honors his altar. In the name of the Lord Jesus. See, the anointing will saturate every, every, every cell of your body when hands are being laid on you. Every cell gets saturated with the anointing. My uncle, my dad's oldest brother, went to an Ernest Angeli meeting. He'd had a diagnosis, a cancer diagnosis in his stomach. When Angeli laid hands, y'all know Ernest Angeli? Ernest Angeli was there. One of the strangest ministers. But God uses that strangeness. And when he laid his hands on him, Uncle Bill, Bill's ear popped open, and that wasn't the reason why he came. He had a terrible infection in his ear when he was a child. Corruption used to run out of that ear, and they never could get it healed up. Finally, it's, it just kind of crushed it over, and he never heard out of it until he was in his mid-60s. And when he went for healing for that stomach thing, his ear popped, and he heard out of it the rest of his life. So, well, I didn't come for that. Well, God don't care. Because it's not you coming to get certain things. It's Him doing something for you. When are we going to learn that His grace comes down from above? And not what we're getting from the bottom up. See? See? Let Him do what He wants to do in you. Let Him. He's going to. I mean, He's God. We're not. <laughs> oh, I love Judy. I love my Dr. Norval Hayes was here in 2006, was it? And what happened? He was here teaching for me. I received my deliverance of drug, drug addiction. Did he touch you? He didn't even touch you. Mm -mm. You just stand over there and he was preaching. And the drug addiction just left you. Mm -hmm. Left. Yep. What made the difference? What did he say? That Jesus understands why you use drugs and drink alcohol. He understood. So Jesus understood it. So you saw Jesus as somebody that loved you and was not your enemy. He wasn't right. the God of religion. That's right. He was the God of the people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was that little bit of, in, of understanding that caused her to receive an anointing from him that drove that, that, that addiction, that, that bondage out of her. That's right. And she's been free ever since. Yep. Been free ever since. Ain't that something? Completely cleaned me out. Completely cleaned you out. Been clean ever since. Yep. Got a good career. Make good money. Got a good family. Yes. Bought a house. You know what? The drug addicted don't buy homes. Mm -mm. They don't. The drug addicted lose homes, lose vehicles, lose loans. But Use the clean. Bad credit too. <laughs> then get back. Yeah. Yeah, the drug addicted don't have good credit. Mm -mm. Did you know that if uh, your child is on drugs and you pay their truck payment for them, your finances will dry up. Mm -hmm. Yours will, because you've bought into that. You by covenant you've tied into that bondage, and it's and that bondage comes to you. You buy it. See, so don't pay a pay. Well, they'll lose their car. Let them, let them lose it. They need to lose everything, and then because notice that. Um, the prodigal son had to come to himself. Mm -hmm. See? He had to get all the way to the <laughs> bottom. See? So, but see, I don't even know you like that. I only know you as Judy. Judy beautiful. Judy wonderful. Judy funny. Judy full of light. That's the one I know. I know Judy light. That's the Judy I like being. She likes to be that Judy. That other Judy was a phony, a, a, an imposter that wasn't this is the real one right here. This is the, this is the real one. Y'all look at how beautiful this is. How beautiful. So beautiful. Now, Judy, I'm going to give you an assignment. I want you to walk the back of the room and put your hands on Brother Pruitt, and his body will take another dose of healing. 
because you've got it all saturated in you. So when you put your hands on him, he'll take another dose of the anointing. I like to watch this. Yeah, go ahead. Hallelujah. Let me hear it. Now watch. She's on assignment from the, from the altar. <laughs> Fresh dose. Fresh visit. Fresh dose. Yes, sir. the truth. The <laughs> G's. That's a good word. You ought to give that man a hand. Always wisdom flowing out of him. Yeah. Relationships. Now let me, now you, you'll hear a word like what he just spoke, what he just exhorted. When you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a hymn, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Now that, that is a word of exhortation. Now let me show you the, the scripture that will back and confirm his word of exhortation. Put on the board, put the first psalm up, Psalm 1 up on the board. Hello, visitor. Good to have you. <laughs> Put Psalm 1 up and listen to this. Yeah, come on up. She want prayer? Well, come up here, honey. Come here. Come here. That's okay. We ain't never, this ain't, we ain't changed the subject at all. You are the subject. I watched him drop on you when you came in here. <laughs> yeah, give me that anointing oil, Mr. Lewis. Put your hands right there. There you go. Thank you, sir. The psalm I'm going to read here in a minute is going to be real good for you. Smell that anointing oil? Okay, here, y'all stretch your hand here towards her. 
Now, I don't have to know a thing about what she needs because I know the one who does know what she needs, and he's fixing it right now. He's been fixing it for a while. Hmm. He's been working with her for years. And like I know, like I know my name. He's been working with you for years. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will not quit dogging your tracks. He will come after you. He will run you down. He'll go out in front of you. He'll send messengers before your face. He'll throw the football out in front of you. He will, he will knock you down. He will run over you. He will come get you and he'll set you among kings and queens and take you away from the dunghill. Yes, he will. I tell you, I love Philippians 1.6. He that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. He will not turn you loose. He will not forsake you. He will not grow weary. He won't grow tired of coming after you. He'll just keep on coming and keep on. He'll stay right there with you. He is the anointing. He is the burden removing, yoke destroying power. He will remove the burden. He will destroy the yoke. He will set the captive free. So the word this morning is associations, isn't it? Isn't that the word by the Spirit? Relationships, Relationships associations. You got an iPhone, honey? You got a phone? You do? You got contacts in it it's as far as you got a list of people that are in it? Okay. Okay. I want you to do a simple thing. Go take your phone and go to the contact list and make a decision with each one of them. Are they wise or are they fools? Is this a wise person or a fool? Is this a wise person or is this a fool? And I want you to edit every one of their names. Put a W right in front of their name if they're wise and an F by their name if they're fools. And so when the fool calls, don't answer. And when the wise calls, you answer that. Okay? The fool was supposed to be here this morning. <laughs> well. All right, well, here. Step up just a little bit, son. I won't fall off trying to pray over you. Well, then say this with me. God, go get that fool. Go get that fool. Turn that fool into a wise one. In the name of the Lord Jesus. The fear of the Lord, the reverential fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. Go get that fool, she said. Go get that fool. Turn them into a wise person. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's go give him a minute to work with her. We're in no hurry. <laughs> Don't y'all love the Lord Jesus? Don't you love him? Only in church. He's real, ain't he? He's real, ain't he? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is no mystery, y'all. Just enter the presence of the Lord. You got a Bible? You do? You got it with you? You do. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it real fine print? Hard to read? No? Okay. 
Okay. Get that Bible right there, Mom. It's your mama's Bible? Okay, good. Okay, over here. Pastor John's face to give you another one. There you go. Here's your one. Got a big old print in it. Let me see here. Okay. Now you put your name in it and you come see me, I'll sign it. Okay. Okay. See, my job. Yes, we are. She said, we're going to read out of this, aren't we? Well, I'll just leave it out, she said. Okay, okay, good. Good, one more time. One more time. The picture. Don't you be timid. You come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Find grace to help in a time of need. He said, approach him boldly. You ask him for wisdom and he'll dump it on you. You ask for a teacup of wisdom, he'll dump it on you in swimming pool loads. That's what he'll do. Okay? Smart girl from now on. Smart girl. Wise girl. I'll tell you, if you would be as wise as you are pretty, you'd be Einstein. Y'all give her a hand. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, you're welcome. You're quite welcome. Good, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Healing you up. Isn't that something how the Lord does made you with the healing properties inside you? That's, that's a, all, healing only comes from Him. Do we have Psalm 1 up? All right. He says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. See, the ungodly will counsel you. They've got, but they've got something to tell you. Ungodly people have just got it figured out. You know how you can always tell real quickly about whether you're standing before the presence of a fool or a wise person. A wise person will ask questions. A fool only makes statements. They don't ask questions. They know everything. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners. In other words, you're not in the pathway where sinners are constantly going. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But... His delight, verse 2, is in the law of the Lord. And in His law does He meditate day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in His season. The, the fruit, fruitful season is coming. Be patient. The ungodly are not so. Say it. The ungodly are not so. Ungodly, they're not blessed. They're not so. They're not so. The ungodly are not so. But are like the chaff which the wind drives away. See, they're, they're just, they, they, have no, they have no foundation to them. They're just any wind that blows and they're blown away. No, no place. No establishment. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. See, people miss church for a variety of reasons. Some are legitimate, others are not. I think, for the most part, people miss church because there's just too many Sundays in a week. In a week. Too many Sundays in a week. You ever done that? Oh, honey, I've taken the pulpit completely condemned and had to take the blood of Jesus with me just so I could preach. Well, the Lord knows the righteous, the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. See, if the ungodly only knew what the righteous knows, and that is that we all need the blood of Jesus and the mercy of God. Ain't a one of us in here that don't need the blood of Jesus today. Amen. Don't you? 
I needed his blood this week. I need his righteousness right now. It's him. It's not me. He'll help me. And plus, you don't have a sin in your life that broke past the blood of Jesus. Okay? You're not super sinner. Okay. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Is that the end of the psalm? That's the end of the psalm. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? Why do ungodly people imagine vanities? The kings of the earth set themselves, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against, together against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Christ, saying, let us break their bands in sunder and cast away their cords from us. I don't want to be bound to that church. I don't want to be bound to those people. I want to cast away my cords from among them. I want to break loose. I want to be free. He that sits in the heavens will laugh. He that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, isn't he? In the psalm, first psalm. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I asked the Lord that right in 1994 when we first started the church. I said, Lord, give me the heathen for my inheritance. And boy, we did. Let me give you a, a little story. We started the church with 37 people. Following week, we had 22. Week after that, we had 18. Fourth week, we had 12. The fifth week, we had a no-show. Zero. Nobody came. Boy, I tell you, I was... I wasn't exactly connecting with the masses. <laughs> and, sir? Sir? <laughs> yeah. Well, finally, we had some people come to church, and finally, they brought some friends, and, and they brought friends, and those friends brought friends, and we got up to about 40 people. And they, every one of them smoked. All of them. And it didn't bother me. I was raised with cigarette smokers. I've often said, if it had, had it not been for secondhand smoke, I might would have been raised malnourished as a child. <laughs> but my bishop called and asked me to come and preach for him in Conyers, Georgia, on a Sunday night and bring your church. He wanted to introduce the new church to his church. I thought, okay, good. So we all got in. I had a full-size van, and, and two of these people had two minivans, and so we packed 40 people in three vans. What is that average? About 12 each? Yeah. Eight passenger vans had 12 people in them. So we're driving, we got on I-20 and drove down, right in the city of Atlanta, the old Atlanta Stadium was still there at the time. And when all of a sudden, the shaft on the water pump on my truck broke and the, the blade got into the radiator and it started roaring. Roar, steam coming out, and I pulled over, and then it was going nowhere. I had to get everybody out, lock the van up, and the, us 12 got in those other two little minivans and kept going. And while I went over to lock my van, something, I don't know what I stepped on, but it turned my ankle, and I heard my ankle pop right there on I-20. Pow! And now i got to go preach, and I've got 40 sinners and two minivans. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and nobody was getting saved. They were all living together. Everybody's all living together. If they were living at all, they were living together. <laughs> Janie told me one morning, she said, John, I was raised in church with Christians. I want to go to church with a Christian. I, I said, well, I'm still one. My ankle was hurting. Oh, son, it aching, nausea coming. And we're in this van, and I'm smelling the cigarette smoke. We're driving to Conyers. We finally got to my bishop's church. Pulled, 
in, and as soon as we got out, they all had to get out and light up. And so I was walking just like this, and my bishop come walking out of his church, and he, I was walking towards him like that. And I looked back, and son, they were sending smoke signals. <laughs> I looked back, and I said, there they are. How do they look? You know what he said? Beautiful. 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 They're so beautiful. Well, we went on. We preached on for another couple of months. One day, we were having an outdoor outing here at Sweetwater Creek State Park. And a girl named Jenny came up to me. And she says, Pastor John, Tommy and I feel like we probably need to move out. I looked at her. I said, come here. <laughs> She's getting a conscience. <laughs> Come here. I just want to hug you. She's getting a conscience. I said, you ready to ask Jesus to come in your heart? She said, yeah. And she, when she, we prayed and she got saved and then her boyfriend got saved and they all just, like dominoes, 40 all got saved in about two weeks right there. <laughs> you keep preaching finally. I just kept preaching the same message every Sunday. And the message was basically this. You knew no righteousness. Jesus knew no sin. And he came to swap places with you. That was the bottom line of the, of the message. And they all finally got it. And it was neat to watch it grow, watch it happen, watch, watch them grow. There's nothing like something transpiring before your face where he delivers them from the authority of darkness and translates them right into the kingdom of his dear son. It is the most wonderful Thing you ever see in your life when we watched it all take place in front of us. Amen. Let's receive this morning's tithes and offerings, shall we? Amen. It's been a fruitful garden spot, Brother Pruitt, for 25 years. It's been, uh, you were in the first service and you're in this one. It's been a fruitful garden spot. It's been fun to see it grow and watch them, watch lives change, watch people. Cash envelopes are available to you. Just raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Come here. Let's give them just a minute to get their envelopes filled out, and then I want you to say something. Okay. We'll give them just a minute. Uh, one more envelope up here, boys. Gentlemen, thank you. Man, don't underestimate the power that's in your hands. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that no two ser church services at church on the Lord are exactly alike? I don't try to be diversified. It just doesn't ever turn out the same. This is an unusual service. I believe in regularity. God does too. He's, earth spins on its axis the same way every day. You know, God uses the axis of the earth to spin so that it bastes. It tilts in seasons, spins and bastes. If you were to move the earth half of its thickness towards the sun, it would burn up. If you moved it half of its thickness away from the sun, it would freeze. He set it right where it belongs and has it spinning, basting, so that it's warm and cold, it's light and dark, and then it tilts and moves back and forth and hurls through space at 70,000 miles an hour and comes back around a year later and it's exactly in the same spot at the exact same second it was in one year ago. Now that's a God, isn't it? 365 days and six hours and a few seconds. It's perfect. Every time. So he can handle you. He can handle us. He handled John we met John in 1996. Got to pastor him a little while. 
didn't get to pasture him for a lot of years. One day he came back. He, he knew from whence his strength was. And it wasn't Pastor John, it was Jesus. One day, uh, John had a debilitating stroke. He said he wouldn't walk. He said he probably wouldn't talk again. When he managed to finally get a little voice action going, first thing out of his mouth to the nurse, first thing out of his mouth to the nurse, as soon as they anoint microphone number one, first thing out of his mouth to the nurse was, by his stripes, I am healed. That's what he said to her. What he said to the nurse. See, then he, then the next thing he did was call me. I was, um, I was passing through Meridian, Mississippi when the phone went off. I had heard that John had had a stroke. Deborah had called and I thought, Lord Jesus. We heard it the day, a couple days before. We were headed to De Dallas. He called. I looked at the phone and I said, John Hart? And I thought, I hope this is not family members giving me bad news, but I had a good feeling in my belly. Pastor John, this is John Hart. I said, sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Speak very distinctive. I mean, you learn to reconnect those neurons that have been disconnected by the stroke. And collateral growth God made us with a heart and a brain capable of collateral growth. Mm -hmm. Two heart attacks, a third of the brain. Collateral growth says 75% growth from the right to the left. Three clogged arteries because the stents are clogged. It, the collateral growth is taking over for those three wow. clogged arteries. Dense. Amen, that's God. And I was back to work as an IT project manager in five months, getting a report from, I love this doctor's name, Dr. Godzall down at Crawford Long Hospital. I knew when I heard his name that God was sending me to him. He gave me a full mental neurological evaluation at five months and professed that it appeared to him by these reports my stroke had happened 24 months ago. Wow. So keep your mind working. If your memories are failing, keep working your memories. They will come back. It's you can work, get son. those neurons to reconnect and reestablish themselves, use your brain, read, let things flow back to you. When it does, pick up on it. Got a blessing for the Johns in this room. Oh yeah? The five founding Supreme Court members with John Jay being number six as the head of the Supreme Court this was back in 1790, if you want the history lesson full. John Jay, John Rutledge, John Blair. Three of the six were Johns. <laughs> There's something about that. I mean, it's a cool name, don't you think? Uh -uh. Amen. But what I wanted to get to was the blessing, because not only does he want us to have life, because he's given me life back three different times. He wants us to have life more abundantly. He does. So it has taken three years, but finally on this past Monday, I have been ruled disabled. Now, maybe that doesn't mean much until I put it into, I won't go specific dollars and cents, but it moves you from Social Security retirement to Social Security disability insurance. So in the short, I got a $670 raise this month. Oh. <laughs> well, that works. And then they got to go back, by law, they've got to go back and pay me 
to the date that I became disabled. Wow. Hey, come on. So that's 25 months of those monthly payments, minus the five that they sent me then just miraculously appeared in my account on Monday. I'm sure all of you... Can you spell back pay? Yeah. All of us have a habit of immediately going online and checking our bank balance on a daily basis. Well, imagine logging in and finding out that, well, I won't say the amount. Let's just say it's 10 times plus what you thought you had in that account. Amen. Come on, Jesus. And it wasn't a mistake. It said SSA, so I picked up the phone, called the 800 number and went, please tell me you're not gonna ask for this back. <laughs> it took three hours to get that phone call to a live op to finally tell me, no, it's not a mistake. It's the beginning of your back pay. And it's all yours. You don't have to split any of that with the attorneys that have been suing us to get your disability. Yeah. So they'll get their 20% out of the big chunk that's to come within 90 days. Amen. So I was pushing as hard as I could to get here to church today because I wanted to present my tithe on that chunk of change. Yes, come on. <laughs> and asking our Father, as I prefer to say, Abba Father. Abba. To fathers, they know that your kid cannot touch your heart more than when they look at you and go, Daddy. Yeah. And you go, of course, daughter, daughter, come to me. And I still refer to my daughter and son. It's my daughter, darling daughter. It's my strong son, and I refer to Mr. Philip here as my tallest son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. How are you feeling funny. today, John? Well, I've got my breath back under control, don't I? Yeah. And the stress is just starting to come off. I talked to a good friend this morning, and I'll let her rub those rest of those stress knots out of my shoulders in a couple of weeks. Okay. As I try to just keep my shoulders down instead of up yeah. and stressed, worried about day-to-day -day finances, I've been able to go back and not quite got myself completely debt-free, but I soon will be. <laughs> Stretch your hand out here towards him. Let's believe God for his lungs to open up completely in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want 100% oxygenation and 100% lung function in the name of the Lord Jesus. Heart, behave yourself. Thank you for a loving church that we pray for each other, with each other, and enjoy the benefits that we receive in doing so. He Thank said, you, Father God. Confess your faults one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Y'all give John a hand. Now, now before, we, before we receive this morning's offerings, I want to show you another little testimony how, how the Lord's faithful. This is joy, joy down in my heart. Joyce Nelson. <laughs> now her sister passed away. It's been... December the 20th. December 20th. Okay. While they were at that funeral, her son, who was 52 years old, had never come to the Lord Jesus, got saved that during the time that his aunt was passing away. And God knew he, he was faithful to us, wasn't he? He got that boy into the kingdom because three weeks later that boy went on and went on to heaven. Yes. So now Joy's son um, just passed, Steve, and, and uh, I saw pictures of him yesterday at the memorial service. Big, handsome, yeah. just you weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. you, see, every day's a gift, but wasn't God faithful enough to 
get him into the kingdom because he knew it was coming. Yes. And God used his contrite heart over the passing of his aunt and that hurtful time to get him to place, pull him over, over into the kingdom. See, God will use the death of another person and bring life to one because he knows, he knows the day of our expiration. And he'll get you safely tucked away before your expiration date. Now, I want you to stretch your hand here and pray for this one, this family right here. This is, this is a hurtful time to lose their son, but I'll tell you something. He's not lost. He would have been lost, but he's not. He's found. And we'll see him again here shortly, much sooner than any of us realize. Now, Lord, I'm asking you to heal up their heart. Replace the sorrow with supernatural joy and bubbling laughter and fun and enjoyment. I'm asking you to remove all debt from them. Give them freedom and liberty to move and go and enjoy their life and, and look forward to the day when she sees her sons and sees her sisters and brothers and kinfolk and relatives that have passed on. Lord, I thank you that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in the name of Jesus. And we have a hope for the near future. It won't be long. It just ain't going to be long. Say it. It ain't going to be long now. All right. Father, thank you for the offerings of the people and for your work of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen. I love y'all. I just love y'all a lot. Yes, they did. Mariah Hardy had a very successful surgery on her back. And doing quite well. And Nyla had a very, very successful surgery breast surgery. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. It was Amen. Amen. All right. Kids on the work. And the youth can be dismissed. Teens and children. Everybody got a Bible? I'll get this introduced in the time we have remaining, and then we'll finish up maybe next week. We'll see. Oh, Mr. Burge. Good days. Good things coming for you. Stretch your hands out right here. Good things come to this man of faith and man of faithfulness. Yes. I'm talking about, I'm talking about remove burdens. Yes. Ease with which money flows to you for your, your uh, watch care of your family. Ease. I'm talking about bubbling supernatural joy. You're going to be calling me, tell me how good it is, how fabulous it is talking to me about it. Yeah. 
Now, I don't know why I would even hear this, but your throwing arm is what I heard is returning. Now, I don't know what he means by that. Your throwing arm. I don't know. Of course, I relate that to sports, but I don't know what he means by that. Your throwing arm is returning to you with accuracy and strength. <clears throat> Maybe that's it. Take a Bible and turn to James chapter 4. Father, thank you for the written word. Thank you, sir, for letting us have this. So easy to live with just a little bit of wisdom and knowledge. James chapter 4. Let's put that up on the, up on the screen. James chapter 4, 6 through 10. We'll focus right there for a minute. But he gives more grace. Grace for what, Pastor? Everything. What did Jesus say? Without me, you can do nothing. So he is grace. He gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Sounds to me like the devil has something to do with that previous verse of Scripture. Back up that previous verse one more time. Verse 6, if he says resist the devil, then the devil's got something to do with that verse in 6. It says where he gives more grace, wherefore he, he says God resists the proud. Why would the devil have something to do with being prideful? Because he was the original pride bearer. Jesus gave the disciples authority over unclean spirits and told them, go and preach and tell the people the kingdom has come nigh unto you. And when they came back, they came back rejoicing, saying, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. You'd have thought Jesus would have said, of course, that's my name. Put it on them. Run it off. Set the people free. He didn't. He didn't say that. He said, instead, don't rejoice that the devils are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. And then he said this statement. He said, I beheld Satan strike the ground like a lightning bolt. He didn't even make a deal out of them. You know, we make a big deal out of the devil in the body of Christ. He didn't. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning strike the ground. When did the Satan strike the ground like a lightning bolt? It was when he in his pride lifted himself up and said, Lucifer being mean, meaning most beautiful, most intelligent. He, had his, he was a created being that had bells in his chest and he created music and led worship in the earth. He wasn't in heaven. He didn't get there until he exalted himself. He was in the earth. In fact, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, I will lift myself up above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He kept saying, I, 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 I will, I will, I will, I will. And when he said that, God said, you're going to be brought down to hell. He said, I'll be like the Most High. You know, that pride issue thing, I've got a lot to say about it. I won't say it today. I'll probably wait a little while to talk about it. But I think we all need to do a little pride check inside us, don't you think? I think it would be, be good for us. I think we all, I don't care, the humblest among us need to check our pride because pride is so dangerous. He said God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's read the next verse. 
draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. you. Any step you make towards Him, He'll make one toward you. He won't assume anything, but He'll. If you step toward Him, He'll step toward you. You move toward Him, He moves toward you. Draw near to Him, He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And this is Jesus' half-brother talking to us. <laughs> Purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, a double-minded man has an impure heart. See? Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Grace. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to Janie about the fact that I know three men that are in my life, men that are my age, talented, way beyond me, gifted beyond anything I've ever known or done. And all three of those men do not derive their living from their gifting. Their gifting does not sustain them. And it should. And they struggle. All three of these men struggle just to make a living. It was bothering me. Bothering me. Just I'd lay awake at night and talk to her about it. And she'd, she'd say to me, is this bothering you that bad? Said, yes, it is. It bothers me. Are you taking the care of it? I said, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm looking for the lever. I'm looking for the button. I'm looking for the answer. Why is it with all their giftings and their talents? I'm not judging them. I want their giftings to be the thing that catapults them, moves them forward. You, you should, the gifting that is, is given to you ought to be used for your life. Why is it shelved? And I began to, as I meditated and think, think about it, I realized Jesus said, you can do nothing without me. So why, where is the lever of the grace of God in their life? Where is it? Where is, I'm looking for the, I was, I, I said, I, said, I got to know what, why, if I could just show them where that button is, maybe find out what is the connection to their gift so their gift would sustain them. See, if I was going to make my living playing a guitar right now, I'd be broke. <laughs> but these guys, if they were, if they were, if they're, they're, they're neither one are guitarists, but if they were, their gifting is such that they, they'd be able to play a guitar better than every guitarist you've ever heard in your whole life but they don't derive their income from it, from their gift, you see what I'm saying. As I began to realize, I began to think and pray about it, it stayed on my mind, stayed on my mind, I realized this right here, here's the problem. Here it is right here. Here it is right here, that verse. Back up to verse, uh, I believe, verse 7. Let's go back to verse 6. He gives more grace. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. His enabling power goes to the humble among us. Grace. Grace. Put this in your notes. Grace is, we've always heard it defined as unmerited favor. Haven't we heard that? That's true. It is. I think it's best to defined as God's willingness to treat us like sin never existed. God will treat you just like sin never existed. He's not waiting on you to do well, do right. He'll just grace you. What, otherwise, grace is not grace. I mean, if you earned it, then it's not grace. It's something that you earned. But if it's unearned, then He just gave it to you. Well, if there's anything we can do to get it, it's to do less and just become humble. Isn't it amazing that grace, by its definition, is God's willingness to treat us like sin never existed, but then 
He is resistant to do that for you if you operate in pride. Can you imagine pride being so powerful that it will stop the operation of God to treat you like sin never existed? It'll tr- it's, it's, the one, it's the one thing that, 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 how do I say it? Pride is the one thing that neutralizes the power of God in my life. And I've seen people so chock full of pride. I have had it myself. I have fought it. I've boxed it. It'll come on you when you don't even realize it. Pride encompasseth them. Pride encompasseth. I heard that scripture just then. Look up. Pride encompasseth. Pride encompasseth. You see, you need God's enabling power. You need uh, pr- s- Grace is also defined as God's enabling power. If Jesus said, you can do nothing without me, then who is Jesus? He is the manifestation of God's enabling power, isn't he? All right. You need his enabling power to be saved. You can't save yourself. You've got, you got to depend on his enabling power. That's what his grace does. It takes his enabling power to be healed. You can't heal yourself, can you? All you try to do, you can maybe make things better if you eat right, if you exercise some, if you don't smoke, if you don't poison yourself. Okay, I believe in all that. But when it comes to healing, you're going to need His grace, aren't you? His enabling power. Did you know you're going to have to have His enabling power to have wisdom? You're going to have to have His grace, His enabling power to walk in knowledge, to have light and discretion. Here's your one. Who in here has ever raised kids? To the best of your ability, how'd you do? To the best of your ability, how did you do? You needed the grace of God to raise kids, didn't you? You needed His enabling power, didn't you? Yes, you do. You need His enabling power to build a business. You need His grace to have favor with men. Did you know you have to have grace to pray for anything in faith because... You get saved by His grace through faith. Faith is the avenue through which the grace was able to reach you. See, you got to have grace to be able to pray in faith. Yeah, here's your good one. Here's your one. You might not like it, but it's still true. It takes a grace to be able to diet successfully. It does. It takes a grace to do that. You have to have a power not your own because your own willpower by in and of itself is not enough. You have to have grace, enabling power, to exercise determinedly. You have to have grace. You have to have a grace, an enabling, a power not your own to carry you through it and reach your goal. God's, I'm telling you today about the Lord's attitude toward us, and that is simply this. God resists the proud, but He gives enabling power and treats people as if sin never existed to the humble. I think we need a college course in humility, don't we? And we need to know what pride does. We need to know. Here is a, here's another verse of Scripture. I don't have it written here. but I'll, Well, let me just tell you this. One. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It's very familiar. Very familiar. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Very familiar. Very familiar. Therefore, my son, thou therefore be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Paul is writing to his pastor and he's saying, be strong in the grace, son. Just be strong in his enabling power. Be strong in it. Be strong in grace. Be strong in it. Don't be strong in the law of Moses. I got in a habit a few years ago to start telling people what not to do. Now, this feeling of needing to warn everybody about things kept coming up. And I kept warning people what not to do, what not to do, what not to do. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't. And the Lord finally arrested me. He said, quit telling the people what not to do. He did. I said, well, okay. I've learned not to argue. He said, every time you tell them what not to do, you're painting an image of the thing that they are not to do. And they see 
Quit telling them. They'll, it's easy to do what you're telling them. You have to paint the picture of, what, of what's wrong before you tell them what not to do. Quit telling them. Just tell them what to do. Well, I still, that didn't help me. I kept preaching. I kept telling people what not to do. I got hung up in that. You know, God's got a funny way of telling you things. We had a large appliance that we bought. It came in a cardboard box. I cut the bottom of it and lifted that cardboard box up off of this beautiful appliance, got it in the house, and there was that box. And you know what you do with big cardboard boxes? You don't burn them. You play in them. Yes, sir. We laid them sideways on a hill and rolled down the hill in them. Yes, sir. I thought, I'm going to get the grandkids over here, and I'm going to play in the cardboard box with them. Yes, sir. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. Put down that iPad for a minute. Let me show you how to really have fun. Yes, sir. So they're all five was over at the house one day. This is two summers ago, three, maybe three. And I laid that box down. I got them in there and started turning it over. And they started laughing and laughing. And they were butting heads with each other and sinking teeth in each other's foreheads. And I mean, it was great. They were just rolling, rolling. Blah, 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 blah. They played, had a great time. And let's do it again, Papa John. Take it back up the hill and roll down the hill in that cardboard box. Anybody ever done that? Okay. Well, as all cardboard boxes do, as good as they can be, it tore loose. It broke. Papa John, put some tape on this. Play Papa John, put tape on this. Papa John. I said, no, that's all right. Wait, let Papa John's going to show you another little great thing I did as a child. Take this open, torn piece of cardboard and let us slide down the hill with it. Make it, a, make it a, a sleigh ride in the summer. So we started doing that. Then it was laying up on the hill and, the, and I stood right here. And I said, now here, let, let me tell you something. Now, I don't want you to get hurt, so don't do this. And I started to tell them what not to do. Don't stand on this piece of cardboard on the hill because it'll... And I didn't no more get it out of my mouth. It'll shoot out from under you when my feet shot out from under me and I landed on my shoulder blades. <clears throat> Bit my tongue, laying there, out of breath, and all the kids come running, Papa John, let's show us how to do that. And they started jumping and falling on it, jumping and falling on it, and they were biting, they were clacking their teeth together, and they were crying. I said, and, and yeah, yeah, they butt heads with each other. And I, I'm laying there out of breath, going, why did I do that? I, I just told them, don't do this. Bam! And they thought I was showing them something fun to do. And while I'm laying there out of breath, I looked up and I could hear Jesus looking at me. Yeah, I said it just like that. I could hear him looking at me. He was looking at me just like this. See what they do when you tell them what not to do? You'll make the mistake and they'll think it's the thing to do. So he had to show me. I had to almost knocked my brains out before he could get my attention. Stand there, look at me. You see, you told them what not to do. I don't need to tell you what not to do. You know what not to do. If I focus on sin, guess what you're going to do? I don't have to create a problem to preach against it. I just preach the light. Let it fall on whatever darkness is in your life. It'll get rid of it. Let's just talk the light. Let's just talk the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Here's the scripture. It's in, it's in Psalm 73. One that I heard by the Spirit. We looked it up here. Thank you. He said, Truly God is good to Israel even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. <laughs> my feet did. Yes, they, my, yeah, they did. My shoulder blades well nigh hit the ground. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Have you ever seen wicked people prosper and it bother you? For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covers them 
like a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Uh-oh, here it comes. Verily, I've cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocency. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you did set them in slippery places. You cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. You know what the biggest thing I've noticed with people that are wealthy but ungodly? Constantly fearful. Constantly depressed. I know a man that's a classic car builder. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Sell one of his cars and you could retire. That's no joke. He's got a dozen of them. Completely vexed over his children and completely depressed. As a dream when one awakes, so, O Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou holdest, hast holden me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it's good for me to draw near to God. What do you say? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Okay? I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy wondrous works. The grace of God he says to me, as if I'm Timothy, he said, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look at uh, the Gospel of John 15, verse 5. John 15, verse 5. We've got a minute or two and we're going to close up. He says, I'm the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. nothing. Without Him, there's no life force. Without being connected to Him, it's the grace, it's the, 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 the enabling power. The enabling power is the, the life force. It's Him. It's not me. It's Him. The only thing that's ever worked out in my life at all is what He's worked through me. I've enjoyed what He's done in me. I'm still enjoying it. I mean, look, look at what I get. Look at what I get. I get to have y'all. How cool is that? I'm not kidding you. Oh, don't. I mean, <laughs> it's a grace. It is a, it's an enabling power. He lets me pastor. He treats me like I've never sinned. <laughs> Look at John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 14. The Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh 
Can you believe that? Somebody talks about, oh, he was in the flesh or he was in the Word. You've got to stay in the Word and not get in the flesh. Are you kidding? The Word was made flesh <laughs> and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of enabling power, full of being willing to treat you like sin never existed. What are you preaching today, Pastor John? Here it is right there. You see that right there? It said the Lord's attitude toward us. That's the name of the man. That's what you put in your notes. The Lord's attitude toward us. His, his, he's got an attitude towards you. He does. Humble yourself. He'll give you grace. He'll give you enabling power. He'll show you how to get past that trouble. Show you how to get past that sickness or that disease. He will. He'll show you how to start uh, paying your bills on time. He'll start showing you how. He'll show you, His grace will show you how to take care of your kids, how to, how to address children with your, things with your children. He'll give you wisdom. He will. Enabling power. Yes, say enabling power, y'all. Enabling power. Next verse. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, enabling power for enabling power. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love that verse. I love it. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, Who are you? Let's go to the next verse. When they ask him, who are you? He said in verse 20. What did he say in verse 20, y'all? Say it out loud. I am not the Christ, he said. What did he say next? What then? Are you Elias? He said, I'm not. Are you that prophet? He said, no. Well, who are you? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What do you say of yourself? I am. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. John said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. What is the spirit that makes straight the way of the Lord? It is the spirit of the grace of God and it's accessed by humility. Humble is what takes you to that enabling power. And that was the lever I was looking for in these old boys' lives. I mean, we've got talking about it. That's the lever. That's the lever. And I'm not going to judge him as being prideful. I'm just saying we all could use a good old dose of humility, couldn't we? Humble. I said this the other night in the Bible college. I'll say it again. If I were to have you all stand up here and have an up close picture of you taken digitally and one by one put your face up on that board, would you like me to do that? No. And what if I, what if I did that and I had the congregation take it to a vote? Here's another picture. Humble or proud? Give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. Let me put my face up there. Humble or proud? Mm, I've seen you both ways, Pastor John. Uh, uh, that maybe that's where this this came from. This this gesture. Mm, uh, uh. I'm moving toward thumbs up. Okay. 
And I'm moving toward thumbs up. I don't want I don't want proud. I don't want him to resist me. I don't want him to not be able to reach me. You know what, what one of the scriptures says is the number one thing that causes a man to be proud and not humble? It will shock you to find it out. Worry. Worry appears humble, but it is pride because you're in your own strength. Humble, he's, didn't he say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care over on him? He cares for you. We're his, I tell you, in his weakness, in, in my weakness, he's made strong. Thank you for joining us today for the Word Wise Christian Broadcast. We could talk these things all day, but I know this. He, God gave us His written Word to think in our, straighten our thinking. To straighten out our thinking is what His written Word is sent to us for. When His mindset becomes our own mindset, peace is the result. Our believing gets straightened out. Our confession gets straightened out. That's when our life gets straightened out. We've just become Word Wise. Amen. Word Wise. Yes. Amen. Word wise, <clears throat> word wise.